Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Good Times Hour. All right, Paul, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world, please rise and salute our next guest to the tee. From Long Beach, the captain touched down and soon launched east to the reach of the Song of the Siren, that magical jangle from the bee, which it makes when it's flying every way and by every angle. He's the Swabi from Norfolk who found his fris Frisbee folk and played a lot. His nickname came down from his Navy call sign of sensitive new age pilot. This multiple Hall of Famer has been a gamer since the dawn of disc and earned his moniker with the powerful flick of the wrist. Okay, boomer, some may say, but this relatively late bloomer swiftly learned every throw until he was great and came to dominate all the great meets at Shelter H. He's the chairman of the board, the senior kahuna of the Captain Snap Frisbee show, the king of the overall who packs his punches and dollops while launching rockets to space above all from the lab on wallops. Flapjack guts, you must be nuts to try to withstand the Captain Snap attack. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and give a warm mahalo to our next special guest from Paradise in the Pacific, Michael Captain Snap Conger. Aloha. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. We definitely appreciate this. Oh, thank you, Mr. B. So, Mace, let's set up the framework here. Yeah. How are you doing today, man? Um, I'm good. It's uh, 11 o'clock uh, here on island, um, Hawaii uh, Standard Time. Wow, only five hours and so many kilometers. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole lot, a whole lot between us and y'all. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming on the show and welcome. Um, we're going to get started talking about a little bit of framework. Um, you were born in Long Beach, California. Shortly after that, your family moved to Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, uh, because your dad was in the Navy. And then now you're joining us from oh, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna butcher this up. Kaneohe, Kaneohe, Hawaii. Kaneohe, Hawaii. So tell us tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Hawaii. Well, I was fortunate enough to uh, visit as a, a turista, of course, and then I worked uh, uh, with the Navy over here, and when I was in the Navy, and I uh, also came over here for uh, NASA work. So I've been looking for, I was looking for a place to retire and, um, and this is it and it's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing you told me in our conversation earlier this week that I don't want to be cold anymore. And I was like, well, that, yep. that, I think that pretty much takes care of that. Takes care of that. Yeah. Been very, very blessed to be able to, um, live on Kaneohe Bay on the, uh, wet green windward side of Oahu. So uh, just as a quick Seinfeld reference for those who follow the show, Newman had a possible transfer to Hawaii. Is it true, like he said, the air is so dewy sweet, you don't even have to lick the stamp to affix it to the, to the envelope? <laughs> Probably <laughs> happened once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So in 1996, you won the PDGA Senior Player of the Year, the Jim Olson Senior Award. Oh, uh, you were of the 2011 Steady Ed Memorial Award as well. Wow, you guys did do your research. Okay, <laughs> yeah, Paul. This Paul's a digger. He gets he gets in there, and I find the I find the stories, and he finds the facts. So uh, you're a Disc Golf Hall of Fame inductee in the class of '96 with Patty Kunkel, Rick Rothstein, or Patty Kunkel and Rick Rothstein, and you're chairman of the board of the World Disc Golf Hall of Fame, and we talked to George about that last week, and I just want to say to you as well as a as a board member and and obviously a member of the Hall of Fame, I really think that the addition of that to the United States Disc Golf Championship Players Meeting was, I mean, that was a natural fit, and it really, well, it's, it was great to see all y'all that showed up last year at the meeting, but it's also great to see a lot of folks that don't know anything about any of y'all, including some of your names, you know, get an opportunity to, to hear some stories and to hear, you know, your induction speeches and, you know, just to have a chance to rub elbows with you. Yeah, that was a really good time. We appreciate uh, um, those folks in, in rock, uh, um, in rock Hill, the, the, they were very generous to us. So it was great. Yeah. Oh, well, it makes someone sense. As someone who's been on the staff for 25 years, it's um, I don't think I need to say too much more about it, but I, I I really feel like that's a great addition to the event overall. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And we were kind of looking for a place for the uh, the actual induction, even though we usually uh, uh, announce the Hall of Famer inductees at the Masters Worlds nowadays. Okay. Because I mean, you got to be Masters age basically to get in the the hall, right? So that's the, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the great place to to let it go. Oh, and is it is it a total secret? Are people do we have people who are caught totally by surprise? Um, yeah, the, the I, I think the uh, the nomination process is a uh, very very secretive, and people may know they're being nominated because we have to get the research from somewhere. And but they are surprised when they are picked, and maybe not so surprised when they weren't picked, selected. So it's a it's a very emotional time because there are so many worthy disc golfers uh, out there that are uh, are that that we'd like to put in, but we they they just don't uh, quite make it because the cream rises to the top. Well, and all the and some young, young whip, uh, you know whippersnappers out there that will be hall of famers for sure. But we do have certain criteria okay. to to. Uh, like the 45 years and, and older. That's a big one. Patience well, is a Hall of Fame virtue. Yes, yes. Is there a yeah. limit on the class size as well? Because sometimes it's three. Does it go up to five or is there? Uh, we, we, we're having some growing pain. So we'll, we'll probably, uh, could be, be five in ties this year, but could be more. Uh, we're looking for other ways to bring in special uh, people that may not have been the best players in the world, but the good contributors and supporters. So builders, um, yes, uh, yes, pioneer, pioneers. So I, 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 my board doesn't even know it, but I'm going to try to uh, to come up with a a, a Tom Monroe uh, pioneer. Uh, entry every year so i just do not know if that's going to fly or not but hey i like to push the envelope that's a great envelope to push i'd be really surprised if that one doesn't fly i mean you know some sort of a johnny Appleseed award or something like that because i mean he certainly was one of the ones that was spreading the seeds um early and far and you know late as well don't get me wrong but there was a lot of people that that followed his lead in other parts of the country as well like john hout for instance and you know, several other, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, so I'm going to stop naming names, but there was a lot of people that, you know, that fit that role as well. So. Yeah. He was Mr. Frisbee South and yeah. uh, he was also co-director of the Riders of the Wind. We put that together to cover the field events um, part of uh, disc sports, not just golf and, but it was a d disciplines like accuracy and TRC and, um mta and distance so that's what riders of the wind is all about it's a kind of a passive organization uh, but tom and i uh, came up with that idea and it was uh, popular for a while yeah we it's it definitely that's going to be one of our sections later but we might as well skip to it now i obviously at these big meets that would happen all of those those events were and still even now the overall events those those events are specifically uh, in present. But how long did the Riders of the Wind have momentum? I mean, is, has it ever been formally dissolved? Is it still op operational? No, it hasn't been formally dissolved. But we're not a we're not a like a, a nonprofit organization. We're we're frisbee players. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it's all about the fun, having fun. But uh, it, it was just a kind of a way to actually just. Uh, make a have a logo that tom came up with and which which is uh out there on the fbs fb3s and fb6s and we uh, put out a bunch of uh minis but it's not quite like a pdga or or the british uh, pdg uh you know organization but it's more of i i think that everybody got too busy in their lives to really keep it going right even though you could still be a member of it if you contact me. Okay. I'd love to be a member. <laughs> All right. Okay. Who came up with the name? Because it sounds obviously like something straight out the doors, but uh, was it was it under the influence of listening to that Extendo record? 
I do not know. I think Tom and I just decided, you know, in a conversation one day, because we go way back to at least 75. And uh, uh, we just, it just happened. I don't know. It, it just happened. It's one of those magic things that popped up. Right, it didn't really pop up everywhere, but it popped up between uh, me and uh, Florence, Alabama. So, Is that where he was from, Florence, Alabama? Well, that's where I first met him. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, he, he's definitely an Alabama boy. And then I think uh, uh, he moved to Florida. But you'd have to ask a guy like Lamont Wolf. Lamont knows uh, everything about Tom. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's and I, I'm friends with Levon on Facebook, and he's been posting some some cool memorial stuff uh, over the last few days, not just once or twice. Like he's he's definitely posted some really interesting artifacts from Tom's collection and his his trophy uh, showcase and all of that kind of stuff. And it's interesting too, though, that I've uh, I've ran Mace Man doubles back in the day uh, as a, kind of a grassroots uh, opportunity as well as something to keep me on the road and. I've been to Florence a couple of times and I really had a great time there. And so it's, you mentioned it and so did George last week. And so uh, I've been to Florence. It's cool. You know, good stuff. Yeah. 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 Tom, we've just battled it out everywhere. Uh, all of the NES tournaments uh, from Canada, all across the United States and down in Alabama, and of course at the WFCs, but yeah. Yeah, he was a real competitor, a real Johnny Appleseed for, for, for Frisbee throwing. And the That's world, pretty amazing. The Frisbee family, all of us mourn that he's gone. And we, Without a doubt. We're, uh, the, yeah, what happened way too way too early because we early. still have a bunch of old old crusty guys out there like Tom Murray <laughs> and, and Stork and 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 Mark uh, Horn. We're we're still trudging out there. Oh, right yes. On. Well, we, that... we've got we've got more opportunities to jump into some Tom Monroe stories okay. later, but let's just uh, wrap up the framework here, Mace. Yeah, right on. So, uh, you were uh, you were inducted into the Virginia Frisbee Hall of Fame in 2017, and other members of your class were Scott Zimmerman, Eric Wooten, Larry Schindel, Schindel and, yeah, and uh, uh, Hugh Lowry and Dave Griffin. Yep. And then uh, you hold the Guinness, you're in the Guinness Book of World Records in a lot of disciplines, according to wow. Paul. Over 65 distance records snagged, and you snagged that from John Kirkland. You were telling me about the uh, wait for the wind. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that secret to get out too much. Some of these guys <laughs> could be listening or, or dig, dig this thing up later. Uh, yeah, uh, Frizzwiz and I, John Kirkland, go back uh, quite a ways, too, and he's a He's quite the gentleman, uh, but what a fierce competitor. Hmm. Love it. <laughs> right on. Okay, so you're a world class master. Uh, did you just uh, did you deceive excuse me, receive this distinction? And if so, when? Were you a world class master? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was, but way back when, I can't remember when. And I used to give out the, the exams, if that's what you're talking about. Are you yeah. talking about IFA World Master? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, I cannot rem I cannot remember, but I know that uh, back east, when I was living back east, I used to give those exams. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, kind of initiating someone into the secret fraternity, you know, the Frisbee fraternity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that part of it was structured. And thanks to Stork Roddick uh, and his team and Bonna Payne and, uh, and Amy, it, it, it just happened. Well, they, we, we need structure, a little bit of structure in Frisbee, not too much, though. Sure. And I think Stork well, understood the balance. I think he did a great job with it all. Yes, definitely. I mean, the stories of him, especially at the World Frisbee Championship, staying up, like getting a few hours of sleep each night to basically crunch all the results it just free computers and then they had to crank out a newsletter for everybody for the morning at the morning meet i mean yep. that's that's dedication above and beyond and uh you know all for this fun frisbee festival activity that we do yeah, yeah. those are magical days that's for sure and even going to uh, uh pasadena country club and meeting up with uh, the the owners of whammo rich and and bud spud and even uh 
uh, meeting Fred Morrison at the time. It didn't seem like a real big deal, but now you think, look back on it. That was pretty cool. Well, it, you know, the, one of the things, you know, Paul mentioned to you when you we first jumped on with us in the rehearsal that we've talked to the the uh, the uh, Pioneer women the first five weeks of the year. And then we talked to George last week. And, you know, I've been around a little while, but not anywhere near as long as y'all have, obviously. And I was, thought I was pretty knowledgeable until hearing all of these um, stories that that folks from your area are telling. And it really one of the things that really that's occurred to me, and I thought about it a lot this week, and it, it kind of hit me last week when we were interviewing George. But what I mean, how did he figure this out? How did Morrison figure out what what led to that? I mean, we know what led Dave to the beveled edge because he was already in the midst of all of this, but where did this whole idea come from? You know, I mean, that's like, I don't know. I hope we can find a way to answer that question, but like, that's, I don't know that there, I think this is a timeless idea. I don't think that there's going to come a time when people aren't playing catch with a Frisbee, you know, I mean, I, going agree, not. Mm -hmm. I agree. I have no, you know, I, I don't know the innards of when all this stuff started. I'm just glad I was somewhere at the time and haven't stopped because yes. it's so much fun it's so much yeah. fun so and Brad, Brad gave gave us a, a a history of all that stuff but hey when you go to the these types of things you're you're you really you're just having so much fun you may not just dig what he's saying right. uh, so it was a, a a country club and full of drinks and everything else so it was a I, I've forgotten, but I, I, and I used to have a disc that was signed by him way back when, um, uh, unfortunately that it's all faded away. And I think I've got it, uh, back in Maryland somewhere at my, uh, mother-in-law's <laughs> attic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, nice I, wish, I, I wish I could tell you what the story is on how that all started. <clears throat> I'm more well, of a user. I'm more of a user. So <laughs> So your your global masters series rank is number five, and your first event on the PDGA database is 1977. But I know that you mentioned a, a couple of events that were earlier than that. But even so, that's 48 seasons on the you know playing at least an event on the tour, on the PDGA tour that is. And I know that there was more stuff before that. Well, if we go to 75, that's the 50th anniversary of. of 50 straight years that you've been playing representing frisbee tournaments out there that's huge yeah i my memory is 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 gone now on that on those early years but uh like i said i'm just glad i'm still here well we're we we'll prompt you with some specific details but before uh, we do we have a couple of standard questions that we ask people about the biggest one is the PDJ number, and I know you've already mentioned this to Mace Matt, but uh, it's a great story and could probably be told again. Oh, you mean about getting sixty? Yeah. Oh, now, what, yeah. You could have had a lower number, though. You're amongst the the other ones that we've had many guests on that say, "Oh, I could have been this low if only this happened," and you could have yeah. been, you could have been what number fifteen? Is that correct? I don't know how low it would have been because uh, those uh, the numbers. When when I met Ed and all this stuff was, was happening, I didn't have any money at all. I was just a poor, poor guy. And and I just said, will you take an IOU? And he said, no. He says, here's the application. Send it in. So I sent it in like three months later and then got this thing back in the mail. You get a, I think I got a Frisbee. I got a little card or something. I got a little um iron on thing i can't remember what else but i met a lot of young people and they said oh yeah i could have had a lower number too everybody's has a has that story it's, 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 i think it's like at 92 percent of the people have a story like that that there's a bunch of people like tina was like yeah we just we we all got in line and signed up because you had to have it to play the event and that's uh -huh. where we were so her and a bunch of people got their their cards in at the same event and like Michelle and, and Dave Marini kind of told the same story but then you know everybody there's so many different stories I could have but Ed wouldn't let me float I've heard that one we've heard that one four or five times now Ed just wouldn't let it. and then you know like Cheryl Newland's like I want to have number 76 because it was 1976 and 
you know, everybody's got their numbers, number story. It's awesome. Yeah. And for some reason, uh, <clears throat> John Kirkland likes to 100. So he got 100. He could have had anything he wanted <clears throat> except for one, two or three. Uh, but uh, two, John right? could have had an early, early, early one, too. Yeah, we. I think Stokely told us that uh, that John he could have had number four, but he likes, like, like you said, he likes a hundred. So yeah, he, he chose 100. that. It was yeah. they had at that number they had one, two, three, and then a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. Mm. So tell us, tell us that, that never knew. Go ahead. What I was going to say. Uh, finish what you were saying too, but tell us the story about your nickname. Well, Mr. B, he did say something about my Navy call sign, which uh, uh, is part of it. But when I was at the World uh, WFC Indoor Championships, Ed had brought out a bunch of boxes, and we didn't know what they were. What they were all they were all the new glow materials, the Midnight Flyers, and so um, the I got to throw first uh, very early in the in the uh, competition because they were going alphabetical order. So my, Victor and John had to throw later and so, so some of the heavy ones and young men, of course, had to throw later. So Conger, starting with a C, uh, got to throw early and it was really making noise. My hand was making noise. So this snapping sound and they were filming this and the audio guy said, uh, what is that snapping sound? And Tom Wingo uh also uh tom is up on the roof somewhere he's not here with us and he's unavailable I believe he was texas tennessee he said oh that snap and then later on because i was one of the older frisbee players anyway uh he somebody said something he said oh that's the captain so captain snap <laughs> oh okay. and that's man, it's not a bad nickname if somebody's going to give you one for frisbee yeah, yeah for sure so but was Snap your actual Navy call sign as well? Like well, I used it. Yeah, I used it as that. Uh, oh, okay. Because sometimes I would fly in a in a P three, and uh, that would be my Navy call sign. I was never so an aviator. You, just a, you based the Navy call sign after the nickname rather than the other way around. Yeah. Well, it's kind of yes. That uh, yes, okay. that's correct. So. But did, was is it is true? Are you a sensitive new age pilot? I'm not an aviator. Uh, we don't have Navy pilots. We have Navy aviators. But okay. um, I didn't actually uh, pilot an airplane. I was uh, air crew. So um, mostly maritime, anti-submarine, rescue uh, um, crew member. Wow. Okay. So before we jump into the, the, the whole meat of the matter, let's, take, let's start with the origin story. Uh, we've already touched on it that uh, you grew up in the Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach area. Early on your sports participation, you like track, you like boxing, you dabbled in others. Frisbee was something that was always in the background, but you and your friends started this Frisbee game called Throwback. Talk yeah. to us about that. Yeah, I, uh, the boxing happened in Annapolis at the Naval Academy where, I, where my dad was, was uh, uh, teaching a lot of you go back and you teach at the Naval Academy if you've graduated from the Naval Academy. So the boxing happened there. We moved to the Norfolk uh, Tidewater area. Um, and uh, I had Frisbees um, store bought. I don't know. But anyway, we used to go out in the streets uh, before dinner, not all the time. And you'd have a team of like a team like guts teams, but they were farther apart. And you would just try to throw over their heads and you had a you had a goal way back there and and I think truly since I played that so much that my distance muscles were this was in the early 60s so my distance muscles were were primed for me throwing distance right. uh, and and it's called throwback you just throw as hard as you can and I always want those the other team always wanted me or I was easy you know they would i would say just pick you want to we'll take you. what you're saying yeah. we'll take you <laughs> I you're gonna win <laughs> and you had to stay within the bounds of the street you couldn't be you couldn't be in somebody's yard or something like that so but i was really accurate and could throw long 
And so that really starts to talk about also like an early form of guts and, and this kind of spontaneous combustion around the world from reading that simple play catch event games command. Yes, absolutely. And everybody put it into their own thing. They called it different things, but it was all kind of roots of the same, you know, I mean, thanks to the World Frisbee Championships and other things like that, we explored the the dimensions on what you, what can you do with this? You can do accuracy. You can have it stay up in the wind long. You can do all these different things with it. I think we've plumbed most of the limits with it, especially yeah. with some of the more uh, interesting, you know, like Alpine distance or what they call Santa Cruz. It was the Santa Cruz rules or something. Anyways, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I want to take you back to your university days. You get accepted at the University of Texas, which you're drinking from the mug, I believe, right there uh, in Austin. You're there in the late 60s. And you now devise a new form of Frisbee game that involves bicycles at night. Uh, oh, yeah. We used to, um, let's see, how can I say this? We used to, let's say, well, uh, we used to go out at night on the university campus and play um, uh back it was disc golf basically and uh but it was done by bicycles and uh and if you and it would be a target it wouldn't be of course a hole but it would be a target a light pole or a tree or a monument and then if you of course if you didn't get the frisbee uh there then you would just put one foot in the stirrup and bend over and grab that disc up there, there was a few crashes, as I remember. <laughs> I was like, probably so, led to a few. <laughs> but we were feeling pretty good back then, so um, it kind of didn't matter. It was a, uh, it was a lot of fun, and I don't know if you've ever been to the University of Texas uh, um, campus in Austin, but the old part uh, was just uh, just perfect for bicycles. Okay. It's beautiful, especially a university camp, like big university campuses are self-contained town type units that involve lots of great walking and biking paths and not much traffic or chance of vehicular incidents, at least. Yes. Exactly. Plenty of plenty of other obstacles for engaged <laughs> students at night. Yeah. Um, and, now, and campus cops used to try to stop us a little bit, but then when they saw how accurate we were and we weren't really doing anything, they kind of let us go. So oh, it was it was fun. So, so we you, would you shoot while riding? Yeah. Okay. Oh, throw while you're riding? Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Awesome. You could do, you know, side sidearm, a, a little wrist flip or a or across your thing. Yeah, it was just and, and I'm sure we did a little bit of behind our back just to be goofing off. <laughs> yeah, it was. So fun. A, a question you, uh, it says here, uh, Mace got this information. You met Charles Tips while you. Yeah, were there. met Charles Tips uh, there. And then we also met him back in, um, at one of the Frisbee uh, WFCs. He brought a cameraman with him and, and, and then we didn't really know what it was all about. But he took pictures and ended up being Frisbee by the Masters book. Okay. So somehow I made my way into that and uh, with some of the uh, basic throws. I think Kirkland's in there and Stork is in there. And um, there's a bunch of old Frisbee players that were at WFC back there. Well, wow. speaking of WFC, let's just transition right to that, shall we, Mace? Yeah, right on. So World Frisbee Championships. Um, the first one uh, was the nineteen seventy six Rose Bowl. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. And so uh, this is a little confusing. This was Paul's. I don't quite follow this, but he said you still throw the disc as a backup for a discathon from nineteen seventy nine World Frisbee Championships. Yeah, I still have, every time you go to the Rose Bowl, you got a set of discs. And it would be a, a, a lid or and a, and a, maybe a, a, a one a forty mold, a hundred mold, maybe a, we got a fast back. I can't remember. Uh, and anyway, the forty mold, I it's a light and, and non beveled edge disc, and I use it as my backup in, in the back of my shirt for discathon. So. Uh, and unfortunately, it kind of did me in on one of them at in Virginia at the WFC. I mean, not WFC, but WIFDIP overalls. I had to use that one, and some wind came along and 
and it went out of bounds. Oh. So I got zero points on that. that if I just kept it in, I would have, and so I missed the, the uh, I think it was a master's uh, title, overall title for with dip by, uh, by 0. 0.1 points uh, to a great frisbee player named Paul Thompson of Minnesota, um, who you guys might want to get on your show one of these I days. That. I got it. I got it boxed in on my notes over here from our call the other day, for sure. We're going to definitely look him up. Cool. Yeah. So it, you are, so this is, this is something that's cool for me because as long as I can remember, you know, well, I guess not as long as I can remember, but like some of my first memories of the radio was hearing Casey Kasem doing the top 40. And during this uh, first in the 76 Rose bowl, you were in the final nine that was, and it was filmed and it was narrated by Casey Kasem. And okay. It was you, Ken Westerfield, Scott Zimmerman, and Snapper Pearson. Oh, gosh. And that, like, you know, that's, I don't know if that really rings, like, if that's a great memory for you or not. But as someone, you know, who, man, music really means a lot to me. And I love listening to the radio. And, and I, I like these streaming services and everything like that. But, man, listening to the radio is something else, you know. And to have Casey Kasem talking about Frisbee. I mean, I'm sure he did all kinds of stuff back then before he made it, but that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's a that's a really cool old video. And uh, Scott Zimmerman was just on Island uh, last week, and we played around a round of golf here. And uh, uh, he he uh, he was really young back then, so he kind of uh, there's Westerfield with a sidearm. Oh my gosh! And there I am doing a but butterfly putt. Okay, that's what that was. That's what that was. And uh, yeah, those. I didn't know it was Casey Kasem. I'm glad you said that. I didn't know that. I, somebody recently sent me this again. But look at the float. Yeah. You can't float things like that in the bubble edge yeah. disc. Uh, but that was the finals for golf. And we just, I didn't know it was being filmed. So this is this is like memory lane, man. <laughs> really? That's cool, right? This yeah. is like, you, got, you could do, this is your life. <laughs> good well, times now this is your life there's, there's hot throwing perfect uh throw i mean you the beveled look edge don't look like that even though this is in uh slow mo look at that look at yeah, the slow finish off the rhythm and the flight of that whole that that's yeah that's amazing i can't remember what year this was so look 79. at that there's there's westerfield yeah, this was 1979. Yeah, there's Scott and Zimmerman again. Oh, 79. Okay. I remember when I first met Levon Wolf. Uh, I had played. He had taken me around the Redstone Arsenal, playing the the, the course there, and uh, invited me to stay at his place. We were playing frisbee games. Oh, there's uh, the captain. There's my throat. Boom. All right. And he showed me this video. This is the first time. It was like 96. I saw this video, and I was like, Whoa, oh, Casey Kasem. Look at the glide. Look at the glide. That's that is something else. Oh, he's gonna be very happy with that. Magical days. Wow. So yeah. We don't well, I'm glad that. you could uh dig that up. Well, the, the interwebs is very good for collecting information. It's just uh sometimes sticky finding these things sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh okay, so we had that picture actually that close up, what is it? Here, I just want to share this screen as well with you. See that close up of that butterfly shot. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about the hat because you're often. Yeah, back in the day, I, I was sponsored by the city of Ocean City, and that was their. Uh, well, one of them, I think the star was I like stars, and I think that was a Texas state, uh, okay. the Ocean City uh, hat um was um that was one of my sponsors so i put it on there but yeah that's a yeah that's a butterfly putt for sure and i hmm. tell you you may not be a pilot but you look one hell of an aviator right there my friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah. without a doubt yeah i got a bunch of pilot friends but uh yeah that's that was a and actually i threw that stupid hat away uh, uh was cleaning out my garage and Oh, and no. we just cleaning. I should have never. I should have just kept it and put it in some, just hang it up on a on a nail somewhere. But I didn't do it. 
just for a visual reference from time to time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think Harvey Brandt took that picture, by the way. Mm. Harvey was a photographer doing, uh, and you know, everybody knows Harvey Brandt, I hope. Yeah. A, a, the premier overall player, uh, an all around good guy. But he did take photographs for, from everybody back east uh, and maybe back in the, in the left coast also. And he uh, took that one before he really started playing. So, hey, one of the things that we wanted to ask you about from that five some that, that we saw there, the video of Snapper Pearson stories, he's definitely someone that you, you tangled with on many occasions through many yes. different events and many different types of events. Yes. Um, Snap and Snapper, was there any confusion about that? Oh, yeah, I get I get called Snapper all the time. Um, he's better than me in general. Um, so but our. I think our attitudes, or at least the early attitudes, were 180 out. And uh, uh, but yeah, he's a he's an excellent uh, frisbee tosser, and he's. Uh, I heard he's gotten into pickleball a little bit. I've never played pickleball yet, and I'm not planning on it for a long time. So <laughs> I'll stay. I'll stay in the water, and I'll stay on the golf course. There you go. Because I hear. Still you ahead. still serve? I body surf. Uh, I, I used to surf a lot. I have a surfboard in my on my lanai. Um, I'm, I live in condo land now, not in a house. I didn't want anything to do with a house anymore. So I live in this uh, nice uh, um, complex overlooking the Kaneohe Bay and the Koalau Mountains. It's just outrageous. Wow. Yeah. Rich in paradise for sure. Yeah, love the water, love the, yeah, just love just love the mountains here. Love the warm temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any any funny Snapper Pearson stories that come to your mind that you want to share with us? Well, I think I, I first met him at 50,000, and I was playing in the finals, and uh, um, I had my last putt. And he came up to me and he said, if you miss this, we're tied. And so I never didn't, we I didn't know who this guy was or anything. And so I just told him to get out of my face. I putted and hit the rim, just hit it just a little low. And uh, so that's uh, that was my first uh, fun <laughs> interaction with, with us, Snapper. I call him Leo. So um that's uh, in in uh his 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 play, uh his current play and his past play speaks for itself. He's a good okay. player. <laughs> that's true. <pretty> cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along. <laughs> moving right along. Hi Snapper. <laughs> <laughs> What about uh what about Cray Van Sickle stories? You got any for Cray Van Sickle stories? Not a lot, although his father was a, a world famous photographer. He took a picture of me one time in Irvine when I had my I was on my stomach with my my lie was way in this bush. And so I had my lie and I've got I'm holding a holding a midnight flyer, I guess, but it had an eight on it or something like that. And I'm it's a, it's in one of the books and it's about how how different throws you can do. So I was just doing a little wrist flip to get to the. I made the putt later, um, but the only real good one I have is when we all flew from New York. When Whammo gave us uh, uh, an invite to the Rose Bowl, the guys on the East Coast would all meet in New York and some big airplane. Like it used to be like a World Airways. I don't even I don't think they're around anymore. And we were throwing frisbees inside this plane with every I mean, it wasn't just frisbee players, it was a lot of just normal people. And I think we really nicely freaked them out. And Stork, somewhere, Mr. B, if you can do this research, there Stork talked about this magical plane trip from New York to uh, LAX about this plane trip and he described it and I have been looking everywhere for his blurb on that uh, but he did describe that flight 
uh, I don't know if he was back in New Jersey at the time, and then we were just meeting him out there, but he he kind of summarized this magical flight, and the Belesquez brothers were on it, Mark Dana was on it, Marini were on it, I was on it, um, and I think it was the 76 Rose Bowl. So I was not into the competition back then. I was into fun. And <laughs> okay. fun. I, it took me three years to figure out why I was going to the World Frisbee Championships. And I, I went, oh, it's about the competition, but it's not about the competition. Well, when I've done <clears throat> doing the reading through some of those old magazines, one of the things that jumps out, and uh, I'm just going to jump ahead here. We can come back later, Mace. But um, what really stands out is the social scene at the World Frisbee Championships because you had people coming from all parts of the country and even across, you know, from from you know, Canada and from from Japan and from Europe and international, yeah, international. Um, but if I may quote Stork here, the Sunday night party was, of course, beyond literary description as it usually happened to be. Burger Continental was the site of the the wrap up party and usually spontaneous drinking contests that the uh, chuzzle gug, the guzzle chug championships, um, you would have, well, I referenced it to the flapjack guts. Is that actual yep. flapjacks you're throwing? You know, no, 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 we're just, no, there, there was a, a, a really uh, thin plastic uh, rubbery flapjack, they called it. And, okay. and we used to call it golem guts. And we'd be in the either in a dorm or in a hotel room, and we would throw across the hall these wild throws, and this thing would just. Stork was really good at throwing. Back and about like they were totally like they would, if you held them, they would flop out like yeah. into the floor into your hands. Okay, I know this yeah. one's usually like rainbow, multicolors, and that kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the colors, but I just remember trying to throw, you know, go against Stork. Stork was the the master uh, Gollum guts uh, guy. <laughs> I got to write the Gollum yeah. guts. Gollum guts. It's That's a, incredible. We did it in, in Rochester at the at the uh, Rochester Open. Uh, uh, the Americans uh, that Paul Murray put on. We would be in the St. John's University dorm, and we'd be playing Gollum guts in there. That's the thing that, that strikes me is a lot of these tournaments have <clears throat> university grounds either as the the, fo the forum for all the events, but also for, you know, the dorms that people would stay there. It happened in Toronto, Rochester, Irvine, Caltech. Uh, I mean, it was it was at Caltech first and then moved to Irvine, but still you were in the, the, the dorm situation. And that worked mm -hmm. out the best because everybody's staying in the same place they're having the same amount of fun they're they're participating in everything all the meals together all the extraneous activities and then the buses to all the field events they're they're traveling to and from again created a real sense of camaraderie and closeness that certainly i think is lacking now with everybody going their own way and just showing up for their tea times yeah yeah they're you know it's, with the advent of airbnbs and you know houses that everybody can rent and go into that then you have your little pods there uh but it was it was like a village back in the wfc days and, and even at in rochester where people were uh, gathered yeah it was just magical long gone, long That's, gone well i won't say, don't say it's gone because that stuff still does happen it's just in smaller groups unfortunately and the the i've stayed in a lot of places back in the day when i was touring like uh for example matt kerner's mom's house in the twin cities i mean there was one time where there was probably five people camping in the backyard and like me and greenwell had the bedroom upstairs and yep. there was there, there and then there was a couple more people here and a couple more people there and by the time it was all said and done there's 13 or 14 people staying on one city block in the twin in you know in minneapolis and those those kind of things they still happen but like I hear this talk and like I remember going to basketball camp as a kid at the junior college in my hometown and we all stayed in the dorm for a week. And that was a, that was a fun time for similar reasons for a completely different activity. And we were all just like kids. So we didn't party like, you know, I'm sure you guys did as Frisbee <laughs> players. But but I've always enjoyed that kind of gathering personally, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's yes. there's stuff, and that and that's one of the things, you know, like. I'm learning so much in these past few weeks of talking to y'all 
um, about the non-beveled edge era. And, but this, but this is a common thread, you know, right here that comes to our era too. And, and I think that's part of what ties us all together is that, you know, we are the couch surfing uh, community, regardless of the year, whether, well, regardless of the decade, whether it was the sixties, the seventies, the nineties, the two thousands, you know, the 2020s, there's still a good element of that going on. And, and that's, that's one of the great things about this, about Frisbee, generally speaking, is those, that's a common thread. It just, yeah, come stay at my house. We'd love to yeah. have you, you know, and yeah, too bad. I don't have a whole dorm so I can put all y'all up, but that would even yeah. be more fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a few Frisbee players pass through here on their way to, um, if they're going to Australia, I mean, you really have to have a reason to come to Hawaii to, I mean, it's out in the most isolated place on the planet. And that's another reason why I'm here. Uh, I'm a little insulated from some other places, but you know, they have these big metal looking type birds and they serve you alcohol. So I can get off Island. if I want to. Yeah, right. <laughs> metal birds with booze. I love it. Uh, before we leave the uh, WFCs, we're just going to take it back to 70. Is it 79 or 80? Anyways, it's uh, this picture here that I got with this guy. You uh, definitely shared many. Oops. Oh, yeah. Scott? Scott Zimmerman. Scott Zimmerman. Yeah. 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 He was here. He was just here last week. We had a really good time. Where did that so, come from? That's a, is that a frisbee? This is the... Uh, I believe, oh, a photo of Harvey Brandt. I believe it's the... Yeah, um, Harvey Brandt again. This is the Disc Golf, mag Flying Disc Magazine, put out by John Jim Palmieri. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so it might be 1980 or 79. Look at those short shorts, everybody. <laughs> look at that. And look, right. at, look at that. I mean, he's the only one. Well, you've got pretty high socks, too. The athletic socks there. Yeah, we all had our high socks back then, for sure. Now, the caption here says that uh, uh, Scott's putting form was uh, good enough to stay one step of his friend and rival, like Michael Captain Snap Connor. Maybe you can talk. Uh, I know you've already told Mace one of the one of the Scott Zimmerman stories. He was young, wasn't he? Yes, he was young. And uh, uh, he was from McLean, Virginia, and lived with his lovely mother, Amanda, who um, was friends with while she was still on this earth. She, and... Uh, we we first battled it out in the first Virginia uh, State's Frisbee Championships in 1977. I think I came in first or second in golf, and then he was right behind me, and we battled it out in distance. We broke world records there. We, uh, um, we both were overall champions back in the day, and we also broke a world indoor, 24-hour world uh, distance record. Um, uh, at McLean High School, and we had Randy, Randy Lom. He was one of the uh, clickers. He was one of the guys. We had a statistic guy, a NASA guy named um, uh, Gary Robinson from uh, uh, Delaware, no, Maryland. And he uh, actually came out with the first disc golf computer simulated game. Um, and that was on in one of the Frisbee magazines way back uh, in 77. Uh, Wow. But yeah, Scott and I go way, way, way back, and and uh, it was good to see him out here last week. Well, there was uh, one story there how uh, Scott and his mom take you to the airport from <laughs> Long Beach. Oh yeah, what the... actually it was from Huntington Beach right after the uh, fifty thousand, okay. and and I had to get to the airport, and uh, she was still they were still there, and. And they were rushing through town. And I don't know if you've been down Century Boulevard to get to LAX, but you, it, the traffic is terrible sometimes. And I had 10 minutes to get on the plane. And this was, you know, the, the late 70s. So there was no no TSA, no nothing. And I had a carry-on, so I didn't have to. I just ran. They said, they said you've got 10 minutes. I said, oh, plenty of time. So, And that was left off at the curb. And I ran like, oj simpson did <laughs> right, right. But i right. made it i made it when you were telling me that story i thought of a couple times where i walked on the plane and the door was shut like literally closed behind me and that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore there's there's like no traffic when they close the door and that's right and they don't care they will not do anything for you and uh, i don't know how, how soon you have to get to the airport now but it's not 10 minutes no definitely I, not 
I recall them planes being held up for leaving and then paging on the airport airport intercom. You know, is this guest here? Or can they please hurry up to gate H? We're waiting for you. And yeah. everyone on the plane is like, "Come on, let's go already." Yeah, right. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Now. We're all here. Where are you? That's so funny. That's so, funny. yeah, go was ahead. that was that event in Huntington Beach? Was that the Whammo 50K, or was that a different event? Yeah, that was a that was a, a Whammo, and Ed Hedrick put that uh, tournament on. It was the biggest golf tournament <laughs> to that point, disc golf tournament, and uh, I just happened to be on. And plus, because uh, I was in the top three. Uh, yeah, and with, with uh, Mr. Pearson tied me. Yeah, uh, I didn't tie him; he tied me. And uh, so, if you look at the stats, it's a, uh, it's uh, uh, TK, and then John Conley, and then it's me, and then it's you know Leo. Uh, so somebody, whoever's doing, I don't know what happened, but they they gave me third, and even though we were tied. So. Okay. Yeah, it was it was a great tournament. Windy, and I had some heavy plastic that some other people didn't have, and I think that really helped. Just so you know, just for the record, um, the PDJ database has you both that tie at three. three for that. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what we tied. Yeah, because um, I that put. <laughs> I put. Now it said that you won uh, twenty three hundred dollars in cash and five hundred and seventy five in merch. Was Is that, that what it was? What hmm. kind of merch were they giving you that was worth five hundred seventy-five dollars? Well, you can inflate the prices of anything. <laughs> uh, so it was probably plastic, and uh, and I still have my fifty k uh, uh, golf bag and t shirt, probably a hat. I don't know if they had hats or not. T shirts. Uh, um, you'd have to ask a collector, um, but it all fit in my my carry on. And uh, I know that I didn't get any money for months, so they they were kind of slow on that. Okay. Uh, Did but they give you at least the, the big novelty check that you could? Hold oh on? yeah, yeah. I tried to get that check from Tony uh, 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 Tony Furman, who was the uh, Whammo PR rep in in, in uh, New York. And so they were they were walking around somewhere, and I just kind of grabbed it, and somebody took a photo of it. So that 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 was a that was that was great. And I'm holding this piece of heavy plastic too, this uh, midnight flyer. Yeah, that was a good old days. Mm -mm -mm. Was that uh, um, was that the same trip where Scott's mom took you to the airport? Yes. That was the same from the same yeah. event. Yeah, a couple of three or four or five Virginia players stayed in the same uh, flop house. So, uh, yes, that was the same trip. So one of the <clears throat> one of the stories that came out talking uh, when we had Steve Valencia on a couple of months ago or two months ago, whatever, uh, was how at the end of one of the the rich Can Am events, the UTEC events, I think it was the Can Am finals between him and Ginley, they had seven thousand dollars in cash on them, and it just struck me that at that time they were getting actual cash. You basically walked away with an IOU that Ed Hedrick would in front for you for $15. And there's $2,300 lying on the plate there. Man. I forgot all about that. That's funny. Man. And every once in a while you'll get a, somebody on the internet at one of these collector sites that says that they've got still got their receipt. So <laughs> you know it was a check. And they didn't give it to us right then because they had to go back and write it up and you know computer check uh processes were were uh kind of slow back then i think slower than a dot matrix printer it's move a big from, company they made plastic so they you know they had things to do one move it from one desk to another desk to another yeah. desk approval approval you know go to accounting go to the post uh what is it uh the office uh whatever the in-house post office is that would have to go to that yeah finance All committee them. Yep, oh, the finance committee. So well, speaking of, yeah. of speaking of uh, over creaking bureaucracies, uh, you were part of a major festival that would happen in Washington in front of I think it was the mall or I'm not sure where in Washington, the Smithsonian yeah. Frisbee Festival. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, you were there right from the beginning in 1977. Yeah, the 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 guy you mentioned it uh, was There's in Dunkin'. Me or I was inducted with him at the Virginia uh, Virginia uh, 
uh, it's a Virginia Frisbee uh, Hall of Fame. Not it's not disc golf because we took in d disciplines from every every place. And uh, but anyway, Larry was the the major impetus behind there, and he we knew each other from wherever, and so I was headlined and Stork, you know, and and Velasquez and brothers, the brothers B and Scott Zimmerman. We had, we brought in people over those several years on the mall. It was always Labor Day. Uh, we, we played, uh, demoed. We go out, we would go out and teach people in, in the area, in the, in the all the crowds. They really, the Washington Post really made a big deal of bringing people to the mall and we would have local volunteer Frisbee players. They would get a shirt and a T and a disc and they would teach people how to throw. It was a great. Nice. Um, yeah, there was a little bit of an Eastern Johnny Appleseed type thing. Well, um, that's a great place to play catch. <laughs> I mean, there's just acres and acres and acres and acres of grass. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, uh, yeah, Smithsonian, right? It was on the Smithsonian. This is from the National there's Air and Space Museum. Pretty, yeah. Oh yeah, that was that was great. Look at that. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, look at that, man. So this is the thing that that a lot of people don't understand nowadays is how big the canine demonstration was in these frisbee festivals. Yeah, I think the owners of Whammo, uh, Irv Lander, uh, uh, on the, uh, the the dog side, and the Ashley Whippet guys really knew that dogs will bring in oh look at that it's a nice chess roll yeah that's a great right on top of the capitol domes oh, i haven't seen some of those things in a long time that's just great i did most of the field events and guts is what i was doing and uh yeah that was a that was a lot of fun and it happened there's, there's a Van sickle and there's snap behind him look at that uh, and this this happened for a good many years. Do you remember how many years it ran? It was probably eight years, I think. You know, could have been a little bit less. And you had one big frisbee throw there at the end. That's right. Washington Monument. Oh, that's man, that was good stuff. It was the uh, the MC was was that Paul Thompson? That was the MC. Paul Thompson was, was sometimes, and uh, Larry Shindell was sometimes, and a uh, rapper. Uh, that's where I started calling John Halk rap. Wow. Uh, that's my nickname for him. So and, you're uh, the one that came up with that nickname, huh? I won't wow. say that. I said, all I know is I called him Rap. And, uh, I, I, you know, it might have been somebody else. It's like Frisbee popped up everywhere. So that name could have been popped up, you know, anywhere else. But that's I still call him to this day uh, Rap. That's a, That blows my so, mind. It was Paul and, and, uh, and Stork would even get on the mic sometimes, Shindell. And uh, Shindell was part of the very first uh, ultimate uh, high school game. He, he actually helped. Uh, uh, he's a, he'd be another one to get on. Uh, and he's he's very talkative and has a much better memory than I do. <laughs> You're well, doing really good. You don't really have to have a memory. <laughs> well, you want to try to be accurate. Uh, I, think. <laughs> I mean, we all probably stretch things a little bit. But the things that are documented, you don't stretch those. Those are the. That's true, and and I mean that I think, even though the Smithsonian Frisbee, Frisbee Festival is documented, archived, logged, that's just one of those things that pe most people would uh, overlook and never really even know to look for that that happened. And I'm just really curious to know how many lives the Frisbees touched from those those festivals. I mean, oh yeah, and we'd have people from the international world. I mean, they would come in here, and they they may take those ideas back to Europe or back to Finland or wherever. Yeah, we, got to, we got to meet astronauts. We got to uh, eat in the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Back then, there was a, a display of frisbees in that museum. There, there, it, it's not there now, I don't think. But yeah, I think it touched a lot of people, and it was actually run on the place where the native american museum is now that's uh and then it kind of spilled over into the rest of the mall but that's where the where the main thing was so there's no real place to to do the festival now 
But at the time, I mean, you were you were getting eight, ten thousand people would come out and participate and run through all the and there was it was very participative too. So people would be encouraged to come and learn how to how to delay or learn how to to make little throws and whatnot. And so you were constantly just showing people how to do these things. Yeah, yeah. But for us, it was the, the the good part of it, the ones that were doing the performing, we we were we had indoor, you know, we had backdoor competition whether, you know, we were airbrushing down the, the, down the field or, or doing MTA. Uh, I ended up doing an MTA and went out into the street and almost got killed, but I caught it. And uh, oh, yeah, there, was, there was so much fun. It was so much fun. That was just, the fun quotient was way up there. Nice. Definitely good old days. Well, Glad that's memory back. Thank you. That spot there, that spot there. I mean, if you ever go there and you see the, you know, obviously, you've seen our, most of our lives. We've all seen scenes from the Lincoln Memorial and the and the the pond there out in front. And there's just so many. Go walking by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I remember, like, I kept thinking, well, I should go and look for somebody's name. But I was kind of in an age where I didn't really have anybody. Like nobody in my family. Died. So I had some relatives, some uncles that went, but none of them died. But it was mm -hmm. just such a. That's a really. Um, powerful place on the earth you know and to be have, have been able to um expose a lot of folks to frisbee in that scene i mean that's pretty amazing it's because so many other things with so many different weights take place there in that area you know yes yes it was a uh, you know i don't want to overuse it but that that was also kind of magical that that uh Doubt it. Doubt it so, so fun Mm, wow, great memories. I met some great people there too that uh, that I didn't know. They just came out of the woodwork and they were as uh, volunteer uh, mentors to all the people that didn't throw frisbees. It was great. So there was a back in those days. There was a lot of emphasis placed on on your group, on your frisbee group, on your club, or your group, or whatever um, you chose to be called in, uh, or the group chose to be called. But um, yours was, you were from the Eastern Shore Frisbee Group. Why don't you, you know, give yeah. us a little bit of info on that. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, there was just a, 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 a in, in if you look at a map, there's a peninsula. And it's called the Eastern Shore. And there's three states on there, Delmarva, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And so the local Frisbee players, like I worked at NASA back back in the day there, and so we would have tournaments, local tournaments at the city park. And then we first had the Maryland overall championship, Maryland State Frisbees uh, championships in Ocean City and in Salisbury, Maryland. And the Eastern Shore Frisbee group was just a kind of a, a cover of a loose 10 to 20 people that would help uh, just, just have uh, tournaments or go to tournaments. So it's nothing organized, not real organized, but we did have a little logo and, and uh, yeah, it was uh, back in the day. It was back in the day. And then I had something called a, the Captain Snap Frisbee show, which was really uh, uh, didn't mean anything at all. I was just having fun uh, again. And I would, uh, we would go to these festivals or I would do halftime shows at the Naval Academy or at the Orioles uh, ballpark uh, Memorial Stadium back then. And, uh, and, and it would be, uh, there's, there's one famous disc now it's called a, at least back in the, the, the MTA days called the, the chicken disc. And so I think uh, Holly farms chicken industry they have a chicken festival, Delmarva Chicken Festival every year. So they asked me and Gary Robinson to do demos and we did. And, but we decided that we're going to get something out of this. Let's make them buy 500 discs. And they did. They were FB3s. There's a big, uh, I have to send you a picture sometime. Uh, and Mike Hughes has one of them and it's called the, uh, um, the Cat and Snap Frizzy Show. And it's got chickens on it and it's got, the picture of Del Mar. It was so much fun. And Captain Snap Frisbee show doesn't mean anything. I was just having fun. That's cool. Though. Now that's so it was kind of an alter ego that you developed and do a oh, little yeah. jump yeah. out of the car, do a little freestyle, and say, "Hey, welcome to the Captain Snap Frisbee show." 
Absolutely. And I, nice. I milk it for everything. And, and uh, so, yes, definitely. After I got that nickname from uh, Wingo, uh, Tom Wingo, uh, bless his soul, uh, I, I took it and ran with it. That's awesome. See, that's, that awesome. that's the thing is that, you know, nicknames, you can never give your own nickname. But if someone gives you some, one that you like, you can do that. You just run and self-promote it and, and use it everywhere. Now, <clears throat> this, it, like Mason said, back in the day, when you look at, at the publications, when you look at the stats and the results, or when you read the, the, you know, the, the, the reports, you see the players' names and then these uh, you know, initials in parentheses afterwards, and that would be the, their club, ESFG or LAFC or the New York Flying Disc Institute. And it was important. From the Eastern Shore Frisbee Group, though, you formed the Tidewater Frisbee Group. And that uh, began in the fall of 97 when you, Dennis Loftus, and Jeff Smith got together to form this. It was Craig Hunter. Craig Hunter? Okay. Yeah, Craig Hunter. And he actually, uh, Craig is a, uh, 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 he lives in Florida now, and he's a really good, uh, matter of fact, he won golf. The golf he's a golf champion world uh frisbee uh wfc golf champion he and i battled it out uh several times but he he came up with the uh, tidewater frisbee hall of fame there's like three or four people in it i don't know but anyway he yeah we we came one and they were ed hedrick and ken hedrick uh uh it's one of the first frisbee whole hole courses uh, in Virginia Beach, in the uh, when when uh, when all this first started, so it's a beautiful little course through dogwoods. Oh yeah, look at that! See, there's Craig Hunter next to Joanne, and then Snap, and then Dennis Loftus. Yeah, Joanne and Dennis. Oh man, you are digging up some stuff. Look at that. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, you're uh, super important to this. This, as you can see here listed, uh, you. By the time of this writing, which is 1978, you've already been in the Guinness Book of World Records for TRNC. You were sixth place overall in the WFC. Uh, you joined the 400-foot club distance throw at the 1978 yeah. Virginia State Tournament, which we should also mention you've only missed two out of the 45 or however many there have been. That's incredible. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the snap technique came at the indoor distance event at the World Championships, a 289 foot throw. So you are you are an absolute legend in the Eastern <laughs> region, and you know one of the founders. And look, there's four of the more important. I don't know who Steve Haworth is. What's his contribution? Yeah, I, I remember him by by looking at him, but I don't remember him a lot. A lot. Okay. Oh man, that is really you guys. That's amazing. That 400 foot vote was really um, important because I was uh, at Amherst when Dave uh, Johnson, Davis Johnson, broke it and got 400 silver dollars from Whammo. Wow. I was at that tournament, uh, uh, and he's a another guy that you guys could. Uh, he Davis has got probably a lot more stories than I have, but he is Mr. D in my book. He and John Kirkland, of course uh and uh yeah and so i was in that club with john kirkland me westerfield and one other person let's see is that and davis so yeah right. westerfield kirkland davis and me were the first in the 400 club and that's yeah. in charles Tips, one of charles tips's books too i think victor malafranti of course we, we talked about this when we had cheryl on the show he got over 500 feet with the sidearm, but it was unattributed because there was no officials there to, to measure oh. it. It was oh, at the yeah. San Francisco Frisbee Festival in, in uh, Golden Gate Park, I believe it was. Yeah, Cheryl and I won golf that time, and, and we got, uh, do you know what a pook is? A pook yeah. is a uh, little scooter, okay? And so All they, right. they had right. this. Both that, so the, got, both that mama story came from. Yeah, and so... Cheryl got one. I got one. They shipped it to me. I was living in Maryland on a farm at one time, but I heard that Cheryl had had an accident and broke her back. Yeah. So I, I immediately th sold mine. I didn't even take it out of the crate. I sold it for 500 bucks. <laughs> and used it for Frisbee money. Nice. But yeah, it, we had a, it was good to go there and whip up on some of those local, local, uh, 
Golden Gate Boys. And there were some good <laughs> rock and roll tournaments like the Jefferson Starship were there and everything. It was, hey, the fun quotient again was that right there. Well, the mm. spirit of, of Frisbee, the spirit of the Frisbee family is fun, fitness, friendships, family, and fun is usually the first. And you are definitely the epitome of the spirit of fun throughout yeah. all. I mean, yeah. even up to and including right now, you've had that big oh. smell. And then some of the photos that we've seen already, you've got a very game face on and it could be intimidating with that mustache you used to rock, but it's still yeah. always about the fun. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and uh, uh, I, I've been very blessed for sure, mm, man. And my family has been behind me on this uh, stuff because Annette's always saying, oh man, we're going to take another Frisbee vacation. So I have to <laughs> sprinkle in real <laughs> vacation. But, you know, we've, we've been very lucky to be all over the world with this stuff. And most of these Frisbee players, they really dig traveling yeah. for the competition. Without a doubt. When you were working at Wallops, they they were very gracious and let you go travel to, to tournaments. They might not have understood what disc golf was or what Frisbee was or how important it was, but they saw yeah. how important it was to you and they let you go and play and supported you in that. And that yeah. 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 It was just a lot of fun. And I and I kind of have to ask the boss now, okay, you want to go? <laughs> let's go to the big island, go to the big island open for a week. So let's do that. <laughs> we just did that. Nice. Um, so much fun. So you, guys, you guys are just one big memory bank. This is great. <laughs> well, we've got some more memories to, to dig up. Let's let's skip to the next section, Nice. Right on. Well, so um, let's talk about the, uh, the, the Sonoma Super Frisbee Conference. It was uh, January 19th and 20th of 1980 at Sonoma, Sonoma State University. And uh, you guys discussed some issues like red, wham, excuse me, Whammo's registered trademark name and the control it exerts over the games, and that's really like that's uh that was kind of that's the first I'd ever heard of that. But I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say or what you had to say about that because that's you know that's deep digging into the uh, internal operation of the whole thing and you know and and the sentiment of the players generally speaking, obviously. Yeah, I don't have too many dates details on that but i will say that i was of the movement that i i the whammo put an s ring they put a whammo ring around their discs on top and so we called it the s ring the shit ring and uh, uh. Um, so a lot of people collect whammo discs that are pre s ring and then people collect after the s ring was put on there um but the i, I think frisbee players are innate um they they protest certain things in life or they are they or whether it's a big corporation stuff or something i mean we want to have fun but sir but we also don't want to be tr um captured and we're certainly not above tarring and feathering someone and running them out of town either. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I I try to stay away from all that negative stuff. And uh, but I, but it was happening. It was just part of the frisbee evolution. That, yeah. What just what we're talking about here, just for anyone who may not be aware, <clears throat> at the time, the national, the North American series, uh, all the qualifying meets that would lead one to be able to be invited to the World Frisbee Championships at the Rose Bowl. Those were all con totally controlled by and supported by Whammo, and so yeah. you could only throw Whammo discs at those. At certain other events that started to emerge, you could throw other types because there were other manufacturers out there that were making other discs, Destiny discs, and, and uh, Sobel was making the Puppy and Super Puppy. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, this, the Sonoma Super Frisbee Conference, was a chance for people to get together as player associations, as player-based organizations. And I know Dave Marini made a presentation based on the, on the FBA, the Freestyle Players Association. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that there was a lot of momentum that was built from that, beginning, sure, uh, as resentment against Whammo, but it led to much more awareness of the need for other kinds of uh, event associations. And Riders of the Wind started coming in right around that time too. So I thought there was a linkage between the, the Sonoma Conference and the, 
launching of the Riders of the Wind. Yeah, I don't know if that was the impetus. It could have been part of what uh, Tom was thinking back in the day. Uh, and we can't ask him now, but uh, it was, uh, it was all, I knew about it and it was all happening. And, and I'm glad that we were able to play um, uh, using other, other manufacturers' discs. It was a, kind of a, it's a freedom kind of thing. And we're, we just want to throw plastic that's round. And at the time, no, it didn't have any beveled edge to it at the time. So, but I mean, when the 40 mold comes out, when the, mid, huh? when the Midnight Flyer came out, everybody wanted to throw that for distance. And yeah, because it was WFC, heavy. Yeah. yeah. But WFC wouldn't let you because that was a DGA project product. Yeah. yeah. Plus it was, hey, it was gl it glowed at night and that was definitely cool. Yeah. You could play golf at night now. <laughs> you know, flash, flash that thing and then throw it and you could go find it. So that was great. Too much fun. So let's let's skip ahead to a couple sections, Mace, to the WFC versus section. All right. Oh, all right. So let's talk about. Now you told me in our conversation the other day that you your favorite was the overall. And so in the world, so world flying disc championships and in the PDGA worlds and the whiff diff worlds, what, what are the differences and what do you see? Do you have a favorite? Do you have a preference? I mean, obviously PDGA worlds is just disc golf. And so obviously I'm sure that uh, just knowing from what I learned from you in the conversations the other day that you would much prefer the overalls, but Tell us a little bit about the difference which differences between those events in your opinion. Well, Tom Schott used to put a, a, a kind of a world championships on in Santa Cruz, and that had the California kind of mother of invention um, um, kind of fun event. Uh, that was an overall event that was up sometimes on Pepperdine University, we would throw there or we would throw at De La Vega for golf. And th those were just great, great times. Uh, that was just, that was just fun. That was just total fun. WFCs were structured, you know, overall events, PDGA, straight golf, uh, much, very structured and hard to qualify in uh in a sense uh, it's getting even ha harder now because they're the rating systems that chuck kennedy finally came up with i think he was the first guy who came up with chucks would be a good one to horn in on sometime uh but i'm just a, a, i started off over uh, overall in it and uh in in the late 70s and just stayed with it but i will go and throw a one dimensional golf game using you know discs and i'm pretty much an end of a guy i think i have one disc craft that i still throw uh, an old stratus it's a trick disc it just goes so yeah you know, when you those fight, are fight turn, that's the one and i'm not sponsored by anybody uh, was sponsored by uh, Nike at one time, but I'm not sponsored by a major manufacturer, which is, I would kind of, uh, I've, I've always liked it that way so that I've got freedom to do what I want to do. Okay. You got any, you got any lids in that bag? Are you all golf discs in your golf bag? I've got uh, that, I've got a 40 mold, that light uh, 76 uh, uh, disc that they gave me. I use that sometimes. And then uh, I have, I will bring out a lid. I'll, um, at some point i have one so but you know lids lids and, and targets don't when you're trying to hit a tree or a light pole like at irvine you you want to hit a lid because it's 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 that's the diameter's larger but they don't like pole holes no yeah right they don't fit very well do they no. which was amazing the first however what seven years eight seasons of playing disc golf was big lids on the, on those cheap little pole holes with the tiny little baskets. So the shallow mm -hmm. baskets and mm -hmm. the little thin strands of chains coming down. 
how they ever stuck, I don't know. Yeah, well, the, a lot of the ultimate people, a lot of the lids were thrown by ultimate people. That's all they threw. So, um, or Sky Stylers or whatever, whatever they use now. So that was that was where they came from. They didn't have golf disc. They were all thrown yeah. lids. So, and it's it's fun to every once in a while you'll see a guy out there that doesn't play golf a lot and he'll throw a lid. It's it's kind of interesting. And then so you show them what you got and they go, wow. Yeah. It's well, I mean, especially now since the beveled edge the, and, and the advances in plastic technology is too crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. So let's talk about specific events in the overall. Let's let's talk about possibly your favorite. Mace? My favorite was always a, a um, MTA uh, or a throw, run, and catch type thing because you can do that at the beach. Right. And I just love throwing against the water. You know, if, the, if we have an onshore wind, you can throw over the water and run up and down the beach and 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 go dive in the ocean. And plus, it's a crowd pleaser. You can get you can get a nice crowd going. Yeah, man. You know, how do you do that? So that's my favorite was MTA. Uh, and just recently, within a year, like April 22nd, I was going after an MTA in, uh, in Virginia States. And uh, you should not run after a disc on, on uh, wet grass because I tore my, uh, my left leg uh, three hamstrings. Oh, and wow. So, so I'm just getting over that. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to really throw MTA like I want to. I'll just have to throw back door, which is not with the wind it's kind of against the wind and let it float uh, a fastback yeah, yeah Ron, i shouldn't be Ron, doing that at my age so <laughs> <laughs> i'm still out there ron turner was on the facebook live earlier and he was commenting wondering if you were well yet yeah i they brought in a, a meat wagon and a and a uh, fire truck uh and uh, to the to the tournament and you really shouldn't throw uh, after it was a it was after lunch. We'd had a thunderstorm, and then I was one of the first ones to be up for this in the sweat grass. And so in between that time, I'd had a PBR because that's what you do at Virginia State. You party, and I shouldn't have done that. And I did the complete splits. I mean, I should not do the splits. At seventy four, probably nobody should. Oh, gosh, and and so. Uh, yeah, they took me to the uh, emergency room, uh, filled me up with something, and then I went to dinner that night with some friends. So it didn't kill me. Okay. <laughs> but I tell you what, throwing, throwing, and right after that, I went to the, the Hawaii States and I went to Flagstaff uh, World, Masters World, and I could not, I, I was throwing 100 feet less when I needed to because of this hamstring. I mean, we really need those muscles. And yeah, you do. kept you kept working it. You kept hoping, maybe one uh, more tournament. Yeah, the, my surgeon says if it has a has a uh, scar tissue and it and it starts sticking, it, that you your body will help you throw farther later. So we'll see what happens. I'm still young. Well, speaking of throwing farther um, distance, you've always you've always enjoyed the distance. Even from yeah. back in the day when you're throwing throwback, you were trying your hardest, and you were always the one who could crush it over the kids' heads. You uh, recently set a distance record in Sweden. Well, I don't know how recently, but uh, 132 gram boss, 148 yes. meters. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, now, yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was 2015. Okay. That was at a whiff dip tournament. Kirkland had just thrown 144, and and so I I uh, I managed to on my second to last throw do one. I think it was 148 meters. So that's oh, what. But a little bit less than a than five hundred, but uh, I thought I had lost the event, but I I snagged a world record that for what sixty five and older. Uh, it's nice to have age protected records in frisbee that gives everybody hope. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and so I that that's has stood uh, until today. You know, it's still there. That's amazing. You're truly uh, riding the wind for sure. Oh, I was definitely that light disc that took that wind, and I did the the Kirkland weight, you know, so many seconds before throwing, and it worked. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, JK. <laughs> we want to talk about the next. Why don't you tee up the next one, Mason? I'll get the video ready. 
So another one of the things that you told me you really enjoyed a lot was accuracy oh, in 2019 okay. at the world overall flying disc championships in Richmond. You, uh, you broke the 70 plus accuracy world record with a not with a nice score, but you also broke the target in the process. Correct. Yeah. I haven't seen this video in a long time. Look at that. Okay. It was perfect wind stepping into that. So those are pretty mm. easy throws. They were, there's where I broke the thing. Oh, yeah, watch. Bam. Now, did that count? Did you make it in? Huh? No, I did not make it in. And that, <laughs> that, that was one of my throws. And then I had to wait. I had to wait until they fixed it. That's Tom Cole there. And, um, uh, and then I went back and started hitting it again. What is that? Like about 90 feet? Yeah, there's three different, there's seven, there's seven stations. Uh, uh, I don't know which station I'm in, but yeah, I came up there and uh, there's Tom Cole with his hands up and uh, Bob Cannon, who's a really good disc golfer in the East. Um, yeah. Oh man, I haven't seen that in a long time. So thank you. You guys, this is, this is your life. <laughs> well, we do, you know, we do try to I love accuracy. I've got I've beaten that since then. It's seven, seventeen now. Harvey Brandt has that for the six for the six, but I think I've got it for seventy still. Wow, at seventeen. So anyway, it's a lot of that's a, that's a great video. I don't know how they took that, but they somebody was there. That was yeah, they they did a good job on that. Very very well yeah. synced up and and one one of the questions I wanted to ask you about the accuracy. Do you have to do sidearm? It's it's a split between sidearm and backhand, or can you choose to just do the wall sidearm? Oh, there's all kinds of people. They throw it. They throw a upside down sometimes because they you can predict the flight of the disc if it's not windy. Um, but there's seven stations, three out to the sides, and then two out to the sides, and three straight on. And, but it's uh, it's not mandated that you have to throw this one sidearm, this one. No, okay. and it doesn't man. It's not mandated that you throw a certain disc either. Uh, oh, I don't okay. think you can throw a All golf right. disc or anything, but you got to throw something that's a a rounded edge like a a, a zephyr. Okay. That's okay. real hard. So you know where that's going to go. And then a lot of people throw lids. I was throwing zephyrs. I think I was throwing Harvey Brant's zephyrs. I used wow. his. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. <laughs> Channel a little magic. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that is involved in the uh, the overalls, and this is a product of the fertile mind, mind of Jim Palmieri, DDC. Where did that rank in your preference of the overall events? Low. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm good at it, and I'm good at learning, and I'm good. It's a, it's a team sport, which you really got to play a lot, especially with your partner, or it just doesn't work out. And and there aren't anybody, there's nobody out here that throws DDC, although we'd probably like to get it. But there's so much going on that I don't have time. But if you were in a, a city that had a lot of, uh, let's say San, San Diego, there is DDC. There's some really good DDC players. Also LA, um, there's good DDC players. And uh heck even in seattle but i just don't have the time to put into it so i i play it now i'm not sure i can play it at all with these hamstrings mm. so i'm just going to have to enjoy watching well uh even though you have played it to maybe gritting your teeth 2019 with if you and jim palmary teamed up and you won the ddc that year so you still got <laughs> a little something yeah i know but still you, you just uh yeah 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 and jim's a great ddc player he is mr ddc came up with the rules so i was just more in awe was playing with with my buddy jimmy nice playing with the with the creator with the creator that's exactly right just the fact that he would let me play with him so that's nice. <laughs> all right well so where does freestyle rank in your uh low middle or high it's a uh, middle uh, uh, again. That's I, I just you have to put the time into the freestyle, and it's so gotten so technical. I oh, love sure. freestyle. Uh, I play out here with Lori Daniels and 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 Jake uh, 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 
uh, Jake Frisbee Guru out here. They play a lot on Saturday mornings. We play at the beach. And when he has people coming in uh, uh, from, to visit them, a lot of them are either ultimate people or freestylers, and we'll all go out and jam somewhere. And it's just that's just a fun thing to do. And I, a lot of times in overall events, I play it because I have to have the points. If you want to win, right. go up right. there, get on the podium. But it's it's a lot of fun. I'm not as technical as I used to be because these guys, they like Jake. Oh man, and the frisbee guru, he's so good. Lori Daniels is so good as a woman freestyler. And I love to see like uh, Joey Hudoklin and and uh, even construction, even Stork can still do his construction moves. It's just so good. Yeah, I just, I'm, a, I'm more of a spectator sport kind of guy for that. Uh, I think I could really be good at it if I stayed with it, but I'm just uh, satisfied to watching now and so just, and, and jamming, jamming with no uh, reason to win or lose, just be out there. Nice. Well, according to Paul's research, you teamed up with Jim Paul Mary in 19 at the Whiff Diff <laughs> Worlds and you won with them in the Grand Masters. So maybe you ought to just go ahead and team up with Jim all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. I love being at tournaments with Jim. He's got some stories. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely he's on the list. We gotta get a hold of him and get him on as well. Yeah, you gotta get Jimmy. He's he's uh he, yeah, he's got stories on top. He's got stork stories you gotta find out from. Oh my gosh, yes. You have well, a lot of fun. If you heard the Marini interview, Michelle Marini the other day where they went out to Boulder and two different vehicles, one was the Marini station wagon. Well, it was so rusted out that the spare tire was falling out the bottom, and and Jim took his van, and on the way home, the van broke down in Cozad, Nebraska, and so nine of them had to pile into the into the wagon to make it home. And I mean, like that's that's classic, you know. I mean, oh here, guys, take my take my van home for me, and then up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jim, we didn't make it home with your van yet. Uh, it died <laughs> in the Midwest. Such a good story. So that's we're. We're just going to skip now to uh, it, with this is one of the components of the overall, but it's also one of your more favorite uh, activities within the overall is the golf. And yeah. I just wanted to take us take us back to the inaugural PDJ tournament, 1977 at Craig Muir. You were there. the The very first PDJ uh, sanctioned event happened two days before that were the, the two days before in uh, Mobile, Alabama. So this was like the first and the first B, one A, one B in terms of PDJ and inaugural events. And you were there. Um, one of the things that comes out in the, um, the reports of that event were there were two new rules that the PDJ was instituting that might have affected play and that might have upset players. One was that there were no extra practice shots to be taken. And the other was you had to have your foot planted behind the disc. Do you recall that that was that like a big adjustment at all for you? I don't think the 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 no practice thing was a big deal. I think the the foot minute it, it the sport had to have some standards. Sure. So it, it, I, I'm okay with that. I'm a rules kind of guy, so I, I didn't it, it didn't affect me that much. Um, again, when you go to these tournaments, you don't you don't think about it. You just think about, man, I'm here and I'm throwing and I'm okay. The rules. Oh, who cares? Let's throw. So it, it didn't, it didn't bother me any at all. It was me. I mean, and, for us now at our vantage point, we look back and we were like, the PDJ is so important. Now we think it, yes. it was always imbued with that sense of importance. Did you feel, Hey, this is something new and fresh. The PDJ is running its first event. Did you feel that? No. No, because it's just like getting a number from Ed. I, hey, I could, okay, I waited three months to get a number. Big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody says, uh, you'll come up and do a selfie and say, oh, I, I played with, you know, this year's the lowest number I've ever played with. I went, okay, all right, well, I'm glad to play. Let's go, let's, let's stop talking, let's play. <laughs> you just never, you don't think about those kind of things. I do have a poster from that first uh uh, with the Craig Meyer tournament too. So wow, really nice. And I think I had two or three of them, and I gave Tita to one of them. Uh, I auctioned it off in one of the Save the Children uh, auctions that always oh, happen. 
uh, at the Masters tournament, at the Masters overalls, or the overalls with diffs, or U.S. Opens. We uh, always try to have people bring in stuff, and the auction money goes to save the ch save the children, which Paul Thompson is a big proponent of. So we have in our yes. notes here that you donated an unopened box of Whammo discs to one of the Save the Children auctions. Yeah, so and I got, uh, you know, I, I tried to send that video to uh, uh, to Brian, uh, and, but it was 225 megs long, so I couldn't. Sometime I'm still going to try to get it to you guys somehow, if you have a site that I can send that to. Uh, when I was running one of the NAS tournaments in uh, Bull Run, uh, welcome to Bull Run, Manassas, Virginia, they sent a Whammo sent a bunch of boxes like three three weeks after the tournament. So they sat at the Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority offices storeroom for three or four years after that. I didn't even know where they were there and they were getting ready to clean the offices out and said, hey, who knows this conger guy? Let's find him. And they found me and I had to run up there and get him. And then they sat in my garage for the next 20 to 30 years. I never opened up the boxes. <laughs> so, 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 so fast forward to this U S open, I auctioned off an unopened box. Actually Stork was the auctioneer. You, when you see the video, finally you will die. But these people were clamoring over it. And when they opened it up, they had the eight, there was HDXs, there were FBs, there were uh, DDC discs, there were lids, just a whole bunch, nothing golf oriented, but it was for, for that, whatever tournament that came from. And I still have three unopened boxes. Cardboard. Wow. So I don't know what's in them. They could be all, some of them that they sent were just the lids that you may have seen for NAS tournaments that said uh, Springfield on them, or they said, um, bull run or st louis or whatever the three tournaments were four tournaments so i still have three unopened boxes sitting in my mother-in-law's attic in um on the maryland eastern shore in a nameless cool. place in a nameless state on the eastern seashore yeah so <laughs> now was that the uh was that the tournament that you were the td for the nas that you won the self-caught flight with 11.14 seconds and 195 feet. Was that, was Monroe, did Monroe get second on that? Yes. Oh boy, that was a good tournament. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good for a TD to run a tournament and win one of the events. Absolutely. Especially, especially yeah. if it's over the, uh, the a person who is probably a mentor and a serious rival as well as a good friend. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, that was a that was sweet that was definitely sweet uh i don't remember too much about it um but it was a, a I, I don't know the second the second um event may have been ddc that would have been the biggest ddc tournament in the history mm. back then until you know whenever maybe forever but yeah that was that was sweet yeah yeah uh, i beat monroe at his own game <laughs> sorry about that tom no uh... So we have next week, our guest is David Greenwell. And uh, oh, one of the tournaments that you played was the first ever, first annual, first ever uh, Louisville Frisbee Disc Derby. That was Dave's first event. Yep. And you win that event. You win it by two over Mike Watson, four over Tom, five over Greenwell, and seven over Zimmerman. You also oh, won man. distance, and you were third in NTA there. Wow. Do you, do you recall any, or do you, not even based on that. Do you have any good Greenwell stories you want to share with us at this moment? I don't know. I've got a lot. I got a lot of uh, respect for uh, David. Um, he's a smooth guy, man. He's really smooth. He's got some story. He's got better stories than anybody I know just about because he's been everywhere. He's been the multi world champion and in, in several events. But he was just a nice guy back then. You know, his perfect hair. You know, perfect. Bill. Perfect, Bill. perfect built, perfect everything. You know, it just the uh, only thing that changed about that hair is the gray. I mean, it's still three, I know. three uh, hairs out of every follicle. The mushroom, 
<laughs> it's so funny. I I will definitely have to check that one out when you guys get in for sure. <laughs> I'm going to be traveling that the time that you have your next one probably, but uh, the, you'll have fun with David. He's a yeah. he's a, a class act. Oh yeah, we're we're both good friends with David. We're definitely excited to have him on. Oh, that's that's exciting. So Mace, do you want to do you want to run with the Carlton Howard story? Oh yeah, for sure. So um, Carl, uh, well, I mean, what can you say about Carl? He's one of the more entertaining people in the, that there is in the sport. But um, he says that his most memorable win um, came against you in the nineteen eighty five Cherry Blossom in Calvert Park, Maryland. He said, I hit a 60-footer on the 99th hole and final hole to tie Mike Conger. We had a 10-hole sudden-death playoff, which I won. We both hit some awesome putts to keep that playoff alive. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that was a dream come true. Any overtime is fun. And uh, uh, and sudden sudden life is what I call it. So it was a sudden yeah. life. Uh, and, yeah, he got me. And it was it – was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, we were both kind of exhausted too, for some reason. Uh, but Calvert is one of those, uh, that's a very first pole hole golf course in Maryland, near the University of Maryland and College Park. And there were airplanes flying over us the whole time because there's a small light general aviation airport there. Uh, and so they would be flying right over the treetops while we were putting. You have to wait and then put. But yeah, he he uh, he he got me. He got me. Yeah, mm. too much fun. Too much fun. I mean, ten holes play playoffs rarely go that long. I mean, usually yeah. it's first one, two, or three holes, but ten. That's and apparently, if you keep hitting big putts to keep pushing it along, do you remember if I was going to ask? Do you remember if there's a gallery? But I know you've played in front of a lot of galleries before. Did you ever have any any nerves in front of a gallery? Did it rattle you? galleries no i like galleries i like i like a, a crowd you know i i feed off of them um no it's only when somebody comes up to me right before i put that's what that's the one they get to me. <laughs> totally uncalled for uh so uh yeah no i love the galleries and and uh, we don't have i mean i haven't played in the galleries like we have now on some of these pro tours i i really think that's cool uh but you know you also have a streaming event which is nice you can you can really and the and the disc golf pro tour and the cameraman you know the guys like uh terry roddy and those guys that and, and uh even doosler's help part of that it's it's really taken uh, disc golf to a new level which i oh. think is proper yeah i mean we 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 were just sitting here electrified by the footage from 1979, and that's gritty, grainy, you know, low res. Now mm -hmm. they've got 4K, slow mo, different angles. It's beautiful what they're putting together out there. And replay function and everything. And just for a second, yeah. Oh yeah, it's just amazing. It's With really the cool. Drone too, and then well, and then you know that if you think about it, this, just kind of hit me while you were saying that, Paul. Is that if you think about it, it it goes back to what we were saying earlier about. You know how did how did Morrison come up with this? I mean, how did he hit this particular invention that still, in so many different ways, is captivating our attention and has us in awe and just captivates us? I mean, I know I just said that and it's repetitive, but it's probably the most appropriate term because if you think about what we were feeling when we were watching that video earlier, that's total captivation. And what we see when we're watching it, watching the Pro Tour and watching these guys throw golf discs. It's the same thing. You're just like, holy cow, you know, and and I can only imagine for you to to like see that evolution from the float and 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 the flight of that fatter, bigger diameter, much slower thing to the fast speed of of say a Calvin Heimberg drive or something along that line. You know, I mean it's just it's still captivating, you know. It is. It is. And one time I was at Oak Grove and I played Oak Grove a, a bunch of times and I'm going to their 50th uh, next year and staying with uh, Susie and Mark Horn. Uh, but one time Macbeth, uh, McBeast was throwing. Uh, we were watching him play in one of the uh, tournaments. I don't know if it was wintertime open. It could have been. There's a lot of trees there 
And these guys don't necessarily throw th down the fairway. They throw over the trees and hit the fairway that way. And there was one little, little hole up there. And he kind of looked at it and he says, I'm throwing it right there. Man, he just boomed it and it got a, got a deuce. That is a different kind of awe. You know, it's not, didn't float. It just like, if it had hit a tree, it would have cut it down. <laughs> but he went right through the sky into this hole in next to the basket. And I'm just going, that's why he's a beast. I got a lot well, of respect. That's pretty fascinating hearing that from you too, because, you know, you've got experience with aviation. You've got experience with rocket launches. You've got experience with the slow flight of a, of a round thoracic widget. And that's still, that, that awe is coming out of you from so many different directions for so many things that are similar, you know? Yeah. 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 It was so it's amazing, amazing sport. And I'm glad you guys are, are putting it out there. So listen, I know we've, we've got so much more material to go, but we, we indulged, you've been indulging us for so long already. We're going to get ready to let you go, but because I'm in Toronto and because this is a side passion project for me, I know you've been officially to Toronto on at least two occasions. You came for the 87 Worlds, but I think you were here maybe even 10 years before that for the Eastern Canadian overall. Probably you, was. Do I don't were, remember. Do you remember your times coming to Toronto? Do you remember the impressions that you soaked in? Yeah, I remember eating dim sum for the first time. <laughs> and the guy said, uh, of course, we wanted something to drink. Uh, and this is in Toronto. And, and, and the guy says, bar no open. So uh, that's one of my best, best things at Toronto. Plus, we were playing one time in uh, one of Westerfield's tournaments or Sullivan's tournaments up there. And you would be playing golf. And all of a sudden, you had to do accuracy in between the holes. I was going to ask you about that. that was that was cool. You know, that was <laughs> different. And uh, yeah, those are were, those were just carefree days, fun things on, on Toronto Island. That was a lot so of fun. You came third in MTA. Second was Ken Westerfield, the TD and all around local Frisbee God here. First was Tom Monroe. Yeah, probably was. Yeah. Did you guys, did he travel there on his own or you didn't arrive there together, did you? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what he did. He probably took his uh, Frisbee South van and took it up there. I know that Westerfield, uh, Ken, when he used to go between tournaments, he would, he would hire on to a turn to a, a car company you know how you ferry cars instead of putting them on the train you just you somebody will drive the car from toronto to miami well one time ken westerfield drove up in a nice cadillac convertible and here is this big haired dude and then I, I don't know who was with him um they, they had just uh driven down from toronto and that's how he got there. He, he 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 was delivering a car. So frisbee players are very innovative, <laughs> resourceful. That is a, a way to make a show for sure. Oh, it was. He he did not look like he owned that car. It was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish I had a picture of of Ken right now, ready to go, because there's definitely some photos where he looks like a cross between the Jim Morrison and Jesus. To be honest with you. And, oh yeah. You know, I don't think most people would let him in the front door, let alone sitting in a Cadillac convertible. Yeah, but he's got a heart of gold. He's a really, yeah. really cool head and and loves the the um, the the dog world. I'm not sure the canine world. So he, he's a very uh, cool dog. And I think the last time I saw him was in Santa Cruz at one of the uh, WIF dip tournaments. Really nice. nice. Good. It was good to see him. Been his, uh, his impression, his impact in Toronto is never to be underestimated. I mean, it was because of him, essentially, that the Worlds came here. The only time they've ever left the United States yeah. came essentially because of him. You know, uh, I, mean, I so, love Young Street. I love Young Street, or I used to, when it was, I don't know if, if Toronto's Young Street is like the same thing anymore, but it was fun to, you know, go down there. That was, at the time, certainly the time your first visit in 1877, that was the beating heart of uh, the cultural center of Toronto. And mm -hmm. it's moved on from to other oh, places is. since then. <laughs> <laughs> look, at, look at Mr. B, sadly. Sorry, at the very least, it's moved yeah. on. Yeah. All right, so I'll tell you my story of Toronto, my first Toronto story. Okay. 
back in the day, I used to do, I was state, I did stage lighting and, um, that's kind of my real job sort of, although I've been freelance at it since 93, but, um, on, I think it was 97, maybe 96, somewhere in that range. A friend of mine called me up. I had been doing, uh, lights for this faith healer fanatic called Benny Hinn for several years. And the gig went away. I did it for about three years, once a month. And so 12 times a year and the gig went away. And then one time I went to lunch with an old friend of mine, Jeff Davis. And I was like, he's kind of started talking shit to me about, wow, you know, that gig, blah, 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 blah. And I go, let me tell you something, man. That gig wasn't all bad. It was a week's worth of work. Made it real easy to survive the rest of the month as a freelancer. And I told him, I go, yeah, you know what? I'd probably take that gig back if it came up again. And I'm not kidding you. About two hours later, a guy called me up and he goes, what do you got going on this next weekend? And I said, oh, I'm the, literally the next day. I was leaving for October Frizz. And I'm sure you've probably heard about October Frizz. It was an old, it was a, there was some overall to it, but it was really a party that had a disc golf tournament get in the way of it, basically, at this county county fairgrounds in Winfield, Kansas. They had the World Mini Guts Championship there and a whole lot of beer drinking and tomfoolery and debauchery. Well, there was a camp out tournament. And, you know, once you went in the 90s, it was it peaked. And once you went, you always wanted to go to it. Well. Like, like I said, I was leaving the next day to go grab my camp spot and, you know, set up camp for all our friends that were coming. And, and Eric Wade calls me up and he goes, what are you doing this weekend? Or what are you doing later this week? And I said, I'm going, I'm leaving tomorrow on vacation. And he goes, well, I need you to cover a gig for me. And I go, what is it? And he goes, it's the hand gig in Toronto. And I go, so I probably have to fly tomorrow. And he goes, yep. And I go, okay, here's, let me call you back and I'll, I'll let, let me check into it. I'll call you back. So I call Harvey Barger up and I go, Hey, Harvey, uh, I knew it was the frizz, so there was always flexibility given and stuff. I go, if I was to get flown into Wichita at like early as possible on Sunday on Saturday morning and I made it, but I missed about two or three holes. And he goes, Oh, we just let you make them up at the end of the round. And I was like, All right, cool, sign me up. I'll be there, but I'm going to Toronto first. So I flew to Toronto. I got flown out first class Saturday morning, showed up, missed three holes, got to play the tournament. But in the process, I stayed in a condo that was rented for me and it was on young street and young street is one of the gayest districts in any major city in North America. And it was at that time too. And I had no idea. I mean, I didn't have a rental car. I just walked down the street to the, to the Maple Leaf gardens. And I was like, wow, this neighborhood's pretty <laughs> happy, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and I didn't know any Frisbee people at the time I did call the name in the directory and i don't remember who it was but it was it was like in april and no it wasn't it was in october but the weather was terrible it was cold and rainy and he goes yeah you're not going to probably find anybody that's going to want to go out there with you and honestly probably don't want to go and so that was my first attempt to make the island and then subsequently once i went with paul i went back like 10 years in a row so oh that's good yeah, the island, I think every island has got a little piece of magic to it, no matter which island you're on. And uh, certainly that experience of taking a ferry across is a, is a magical, you know, deconnection from the, the, the urban pulse of the city. And you, for a cheap fare, you get to cross the waters and you're over there isolated. But yeah. um, listen, uh, Captain Snap, we can't thank you enough for taking all this time for sharing sharing the jam, spreading the love, spreading the light, and telling us some really great stories. You truly do embody the spirit of the game and a legendary Hall of Fame figure, as well as doing amazing work for the Disc Golf, the World Disc Golf Hall of Fame, amongst other things. So thanks again for coming by uh, the Good Times Hour and spending a good times almost two hours with us. Wow. All right. You have to change your logo. But <laughs> I really, uh, you're welcome, and I appreciate the chance to uh, go down memory lane. I, uh, you guys really did a, a great job, whatever you had to go through to do this. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, thank you. I'm honored. It's our honor. Too. Yeah, we, we really appreciate you spending the time with us. And um, it was definitely, it's, man, like I said yesterday, the other day when we were talking on the phone, it's really been fascinating to have you guys, all of y'all, enlighten us with you know with this knowledge and i thought i was pretty knowledgeable and now i'm looking forward to what am i going to learn next weekend you know so 
Yeah. And George has got some good stories too. Oh my gosh. George has got great. I'll have to go back and pull up his, uh, his event on your uh, website and uh, check it out. Yeah. He was, he was a great guest too. We've had, we've had nothing but great guests and great stories and uh, we're looking forward to where it's going and we can't wait to see you. Hopefully we'll cross paths with you somewhere down the line. In the meantime, just keep, keep smiling and keep jamming. Yep. Thank you very much. And good, good chat and good meeting you guys in, uh, in uh, South Carolina. And as Tom Monroe would always say, happy trails. Perfect. Right on, buddy. Thanks exactly. a lot. Have a good, have a good afternoon. <laughs> All, right. All right. Aloha. Aloha. All right. Aloha.